Hey guys, welcome back. We're still in chapter 14, section 2 this time of the book. And so we're going to take a look, uh, we're going to change gears a little bit. And so we've been talking about the church in the last section and uh, the way that the church should change and the crusades and some things like that. Today we're going to talk about what else is going on in the Middle Ages about this time between 1000 and 1300 or so. Um, we've got three big advances that are going on. The first one is agriculture, the second one is trade. And the third one is finance, money. And so those are the three things that we're going to be looking at today. The towns and the cities are growing, and this is because of um, a growing food supply. Um, remember, we talked all the way back in Chapter 1 about if you have more food, people don't have to, everybody doesn't have to be a farmer, or people can specialize and do other things. And so we have some advances in agriculture, which are really going to... Um, help us out as far as bringing in more food and so the more food we have the less farmers we're going to need and people can switch to other things. So our first th big thing is our switch to horsepower. Um, we've all heard of horsepower today when we talk about cars and things but we're talking about true horsepower here um, in the uh, in the Middle Ages. Up until this time we're using oxen to plow our fields and oxen are, are nice they are able to plow the fields um, but we're using them because they're cheaper, um, they're, they cost less to feed, um, there's less upkeep and things like that. Um, but around the year 900, a new harness is going to be developed for horses. And um, we're able to do about three times the work that an ox can do with this horse. And so now all of a sudden, um, it's much more cost efficient to use horses because you can get a lot more food out of one horse than you can out of one ox. And so um, it, the payoff is much better. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a three-field system. It's called three-field system. This is kind of exactly what it sounds like. We're going to have th pretend that you split up your field into three. Um, what used to happen is the farmers would split their fields into two. And so um, they would grow stuff on one half of their farm and then leave the other half to rest um, each year. And then they, they would just swap each year. Um, they would That way um, the the ground had a chance to kind of regenerate and to kind of get more um, more nutrients and things like that into it and you wouldn't just run it and so that nothing would eventually grow there um, and so what would they figure out though is they were resting too much they didn't need to rest it nearly as much as they were and so they split their fields into three now and so instead of just growing on one half of their field they're growing on two-thirds of their fields and so then they leave just one-third um, bare and let that rest and then they would switch out um, the next year leave a different one-third um, um, to, to rest and have the other two-thirds growing and they keep swapping out each year and so they were able to get quite a bit more food out of their fields each year and so we've got a lot more food and so what that means in the end is people don't have to be um, farmers anymore and people can go and do other things and so this is going to bring us into the guilds the guilds um if you look in your book this is going to be the same thing as in your notes right here um, but this is um, this is the the path to become a master in in the guilds, and so we're going to kind of walk through that um, that path here. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to be an apprentice, and to be an apprentice, um, it's not far off of being a slave or a. Um, a peasant serf or anything like that but what's going to happen is um, the apprentice is going to pay for you to go into training and you're going to live with a master and his family and you're going to do whatever they tell you to do whether it's to learn your trade or whether it's to clean their house or whatever they decide you they need you to do you're going to be trained for two to seven years and that's going to depend on the field that you're going into if you're going to be a blacksmith or a leather smith whatever whatever you're going into um, you were not allowed to get married during your training but when you finished your training you became a journeyman which was just kind of a regular day worker and this is what you did and so you worked for your master now so now you're able to at least earn a salary for doing your job and so you would do this six days a week you would work for the master and you would need to produce what was called a masterpiece um, to become a master and so this would be your finest work and so you would prove to everyone that you are um, an elite in your field and so then you had to be accepted into the guild to become a master now the guild isn't going to accept just anybody and so so you probably need some connections here not unlike our political systems or anything else that are going on but if you can become a master then you're able to own your own shop 
you are able to work with other masters to kind of protect their trade. And so remember, you don't want too many people to be a, a master. And so that some that is going to kind of limit um, how many people are accepted into um, the guild for uh, for the masters. And then sometimes the um, the masters are also going to work in um, in civic government things like that. So there's some power that goes along with it. Uh, the next thing is we have what's called the commercial revolution. This is an expansion of trade, an expansion of business. Um, what was happening is we talked um, in chapter 13 about the peasants on the farms and how they were able to to keep just a, a fraction of what they were able to uh, to grow. Most of it had to go to the Lord, but they were able to keep some of, uh, some of that. And so what they would do is they would go into town with this stuff. And so they would trade what they, um, what they were able to grow, what they were able to... Uh, um, to culture there for, um, for things like bacon or salt or honey cheese, wine, leather, dyes, knives, ropes, uh, all these things listed in, in the notes here below. Uh, but they would go into fairs. And so they would bring their stuff in, um, sell their stuff, get other stuff for them, and then go back. And so this starts the end of the manor system because what would happen is people would, um, people who are good business people would save up enough to go into town. They'd be like, hmm, kind of like it here. And so they start to stay in the towns rather than going back to the manors. Um, and so the next thing that happens is people start figuring out, um, these entrepreneurs start figuring out, hmm, if I buy up everything here at this fair and take it to the fair down the road who doesn't have this stuff, I can then sell it for a higher price there and I can start making money off of what other people are doing. So these are our first kind of um, uh, stock brokers of the world here almost. And so they might buy up all the bacon and salt at one fair where there's a lot of it and then go down the road to where another fair where there's almost none of it, sell it for a higher price and um, they would become richer off of this. Now the problem is going to be they need to carry um, a lot of money with them. And so you can imagine there are people who are going to be in the forests and things in between towns who are going to jump out and try to try to rob them and try to uh, take down their stuff. So what would eventually happen is banks would come along and they would establish written notes of credit so that they could eliminate the need to carry the sums of money. So they could write a check, basically, for um, for the money that they needed and the, the bank would say, yep, they're good for it and, and go ahead. So this is kind of the first uh, kind of non-money-money, um, non, non money if you want to go that route with it. Um, almost like uh, you're buying things on credit and selling things on credit. Um, and so that's where this is going to start here in business and banking in the commercial revolution. And so during all this time, urban life is going to flourish. Remember, urban is in the city, rural is outside the city. And so urban life starts to um, flourish here. And so our trade and our towns are going to start growing. Um, as trade grows, um, so does um, so do the towns all over Europe. And so especially the ones who have the bigger fairs, they're going to um, just kind of explode with population. And so um, we think that, you know, oh, they're off of the farms. Things are going to be easier in town. And this isn't always the case. Uh, life in the towns is not all all that easy. Um, the streets were very, very narrow. They were not built for lots of population, and this population is exploding almost overnight. Um, and so they're packed with these animals trying to get things from back and forth, back and forth. And so we have... Um, Animal droppings, we'll call them, all over the streets, and there's no, uh, there's nobody to just kind of come by with a broom to clean this up. So this is everywhere. People are stepping in it, and then, so it's going to stink in town. There's also no sewers. Remember, there's no, um, there's no running water or anything like that in the houses. And so what they're going to do is they're going to have a bucket in the house, and you just empty it out the window. And so this is now, the people have their uh, droppings, we'll call them, in the streets. And so it's even, it's even worse. There's no garbage men to take things away. So um, after dinner with the rest of your garbage or whatever they'll just toss that out the window so we can imagine what these streets are smelling like and what's going to happen is we're going to wind up with rats and other um, undesirable animals um, running the streets and taking things like that the next thing is um, all the houses are made with thatch roofs thatch is going to be you know um, made of wood and things like that and so if one catches on fire um, the whole um, the whole city might go up in flames because they're all so close together um, and so one is going to catch the next, going to catch the next and there's no there's no fire truck that's going to come and save you at this time. Um, 
But running away from the feudal lands did help a lot of the serfs because um, remember, there's no there's no chance to advance your um, your status in life on the manor. At least in town, you have a chance to move up the class position if you are a good business person, if you have some good business sense, things like that. So um, that's it for chapter 14, section two. Uh, hopefully you're having a great night and we'll see you in class tomorrow.